And welcome back to the Livingston Parish News Weekly Show, a podcast brought to you by the Livingston Parish News. My name is McHugh David, publisher and editor of the news. And we've got a new lady on the podcast scene here in Livingston Parish. Uh, she's doing something very interesting, and it actually goes along with uh, the profession she was already involved in, so it's going to be interesting. But first and foremost, we're going to let her introduce herself real quick. So please, take a second, introduce yourself, say hello, good morning. Sure. My name's Kelly Jennings. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm pretty excited to be here, and podcasting's a new adventure for me, but it kind of comes naturally, I guess, because I've been teaching for so long. Um, question and answer is the game, and research is the fun part for me. Sure, and education, uh, obvious there, that was a very educator good morning, uh, <laughs> how to wake up a class. So uh, first and foremost, let's talk about that, because it, 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 in a way, after reading your bio, it kind of led into what you're trying to do in the podcast realm. So right now, uh, you work for the Livingston Parish School Board. You teach criminal justice, correct? Yes. Well, yeah, tell, tell <laughs> yeah. so I do. That. I teach in Livingston Parish, and um, I really love my job. So I, I started out actually not, uh, teaching was not the profession I was going to choose. I uh, have a criminal justice, you know, education and background. And so I thought that I was going to go be a warden somewhere and dr was dreaming big. And so I went to go work at Angola, loved it. Um, working with the inmates was, you know, an eye-opening experience. And I got to learn a lot about the criminal element there. And <clears throat> one thing just kind of led to another and I really was just offered this opportunity to teach teenagers. And I thought, oh, no, I don't know. I don't know. I'm cut out for that. But um, took it. It's been 15 years now. I love it. And I really look forward to showing up to work every day. You know, and that's interesting. Uh, can you ha you can handle Angola, but can you handle kids? I, it, <laughs> yeah. You know, there was a learning curve because you, you're not supposed to cuss the kids. And you can't, you know, tell them catch a wall or whatever. But there's, you know, there's tact in dealing with teenagers and they get the drift. Sure. So we'll get it. We'll get into what it's like to be in, uh, what it's like for you to be an educator in a second, but let's talk about your podcast. So first and foremost, what's the name of it? Sure. It's called unspeakable, a true crime podcast by Kelly Jennings. Okay. And uh, you know, tell us a little bit about, I always like to start from the beginning. When I say the beginning, it, at some point this idea struck you. When did that happen? How did that happen? Yeah, again, I hate to keep saying things kind of just happened uh, by chance, but I'm actually friends with Woody Overton, who is a huge podcaster, as you know, people who listen to True Crime know, and he does real, li real life, real crime. And then Jim Chapman is also a friend of mine, and so they do Bloody Angola together. Well, because I worked at Angola, long story short, Jim and Woody were like, hey, you should come talk on this podcast. And I kind of was like, nah, I don't think I want to do that. And then finally, my husband was like, just go do it. I said, all right, fine. So jumped in. And it just evolved into, hey, you should do one on your own. And here I am. Well, isn't that a good partnership, right? Yeah. With your husband. Just do it. I mean, come on. Just do it. So, you know, it's a sign of a supportive spouse. Oh, my God, yes. And and he's so handsome to boot. Oh, so. there you go. Hey, <laughs> shout out for the husband. Your husband's name is? Blake Jennings. Oh, congratulations, Blake. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when you were thinking about putting this together, producing it, what, what was your thought? Where'd you start? Sure. So whenever I think about crime, research crime, and I'm teaching crime to these kids, I always have a heart for the victim. And I really want them to understand the criminal justice system and everything from the commission of a crime all the way through the death penalty. OK, and we cover all of it. And I also teach 911 dispatch certification as well. So I have a couple of different courses, you know, that I teach. But something that struck me was that we all love true crime. A lot of, you know, people that take the class, but sometimes they seem to kind of skip over the victim. And it's like, wait a minute, back up a second. Sure, these people did horrific things. We're not, that's not normal. That's why we're so in shock and awe by it. But let's not also forget that that victim was real. And what that victim went through was real and traumatic and sometimes cost them their life. And I uh, have a very huge heart for teenagers, um, specifically the realm of, of sex abuse. I, I cannot stand it. And having taught for 15 years, I have been personally, um, uh, you know, the students speak, talk to me. Sure. And you can't unhear it and you can't unsee it. And it just fuels a, a passion in me that I want to tell crime, but I want people to learn from it, learn the signs, learn what you're looking for. So not only is it, you know, this crazy story, but also there's some information we should know from a from a learning standpoint of what we can do to change in the future. Maybe potentially save someone who would have been a victim. Sure. And you kind of already got into my next question was, how did you want to try to meld what you knew, what you had experienced and what you had learned with your education to kind of formulate this podcast? But I'm guessing that's that's you answered that question. Right. Because it's, you know, 
when you think about someone doing a podcast, what I always thought a podcast was, was someone just research, you know, knew a story and just kind of spit it, you know, over the microphone. But when I go to tell a story, to me, you have to stop and you have to assess and you have to point out things. So, for example, in one of my recent episodes, I was talking about a girl who was actually groomed by her own father and they became lovers. And while off the cuff, that seems like, holy crap, like, how could that be? When you take it and you break it down from a grooming sex offender standpoint and from the relationship that they had, and I won't, you know, go deep into it right now, but I can explain to you how it happened. I'm not saying that it's comfortable. I'm not saying that it's normal or right, but I'm explaining to you how it happened so that maybe you can learn from that um, in the future. And also not to judge teenagers, you know, sexuality is a part of them and we tend to go Ugh, whenever it's brought up. And so these cases are very shocking, but we got to understand that they're kids and learn, you know. Sure. So uh, where, you know, I know that you said uh, you teach criminal justice. You also do 911 certification. You're on the board for the 911 uh, dispatch, correct? Correct. I'm, okay. I'm on the board in Livingston. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, of course, we have, uh, I, you can't call it a brand, brand new facility, but a nice new facility over there in the, in the Satsuma area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very cool facility. Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about how you want to present this and what you want to present, but first how we've discussed that, which is sort of an educational standpoint, mm -hmm. but from a what, how do you decide what goes into each episode? I would honestly tell you it's it's almost organic. So I read a lot. If I'm not researching crime or teaching crime, I'm reading about true crime. And so a lot of my inspiration, if you will, comes from um, the books that I read. And I like to read books that are written by victims or uh, the family of people that it happened to, not just by the press, if you will, you know, a firsthand account. Sure. And so when I read from there, I get different viewpoints. And I, you know, because I believe maybe I do have a law enforcement background as well with the sheriff's office. But you know, I've always, you know, learned that half of what someone tells you and half of what the other person tell you somewhere in the middle, sure. right, is the truth. Sure. And I really want to find the truth or the reality of it. So my inspiration, I would say I choose comes from what I read combined with what I um, know from an edu educational standpoint. And I just kind of combine the two. Sure. Sure. And and you said something that was interesting. Obviously, you're interviewing with a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Our <laughs> our stories are usually pretty black and white. Right. We don't get into the emotional side a lot uh, because, you know, there's there's shades of gray there and, yeah. and we have rules we have to follow. But mm -hmm. when you're talking about from your standpoint, you want that emotion, correct? Yes, because it's real. And I, and I have a when you have a passion for something, for example, you, you love, um you know, doing your investigative, I guess, or going out and asking questions and interviewing people. And you do it for a living because you love it. Well, I teach because I love it. But I podcast because I love it so much that I want to be able to give something to other people um, that, again, they can potentially save someone's life. They can potentially see something that's like an aha moment that they didn't have before that. Sure. You know? And yeah, yeah, yeah it's so important because sometimes things are so obvious that we don't see it. Sure. And so, uh, you know, a follow up to that, when you're talking, I, I, I think it was on the tip of your tongue. When you input that emotion, it makes it more real. Yeah. It makes it resonate with people more. Would you, would you say that's the case? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm sassy. I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to be, I get it from a grandma. Okay. But I'm sassy. And when I get an attitude about something, I cannot hold it back. It's coming out and I'm going to say my piece and it is what it is. But I hope that when people see how passionate I get, it's coming from a, pa a place of education, but it's coming from a place from experience. And it's coming from a place of we need to get our crap together as a society and we need to protect these people. Sure. So we discussed where you kind of come up with ideas for the episodes. Anything you've experienced firsthand, either through 911 or Angola, or are these all sort of separate that you know of and research, or maybe a little bit of both? Most recently, and you probably are familiar with the case, I'm not going to name who they are because it's, um, I'm just not going to name who they are right now. Sure, sure. But I... I personally have been affected by someone that I loved and trusted that I thought was a great human being 
he and his wife. And um, the last text message we ever exchanged was me saying, don't take the fall for her. Jesus knows your heart, quote unquote. And if I was not completely and totally duped by this man, and it's disgusting what he's done, and he's getting his day in court soon. But I'm telling you, that fuels my fire because I cannot stand these predators that walk amongst us. And if, you're few, if, you, if you were able to trick me for 15, 20 years, my God. Sure. So you have a lot of background in, the, in this. And so if you feel like you've been tricked, you kind of feel this uh, personal responsibility to try to educate people on what could happen. 100%. 100%. Because not everybody thinks like me. Not everybody is, um, you know, I'm bold. I guess I'm bold would be a word because I will tell someone to get out of my face. I will tell someone, no, you're not going to talk to me like that. But not everybody has that personality. And to me, you're just, I'm looking at someone who has no clue that they are an absolute predator's dream. And we wonder how people get away with such immoral and indecent things in our society. And it's because People are so unsuspecting. Sure. They don't look at things through the, you know, with a law enforcement background, I'll tell you this. A lot of people say, well, are, you know, cops are jerks and this, that and the other. No, we're not. Or they're not. You know, we pull people over and we don't know if someone wants to kill us or not. You right. may not. You may not at that point when you got pulled over. You may have good intentions and a good heart, but there's a lot of people that don't. And so if you haven't done something for a living, you know, I've never been a brain surgeon, so I don't give advice on how to be a brain surgeon. I've never been an astronaut. I don't give advice to NASA because NASA doesn't care what I have to say. And I think in crime-related fields, you get kind of jaded where you're like, you don't know crime and you don't know criminals because you don't deal with them daily. Right. And once you've had that experience, you don't, you can't forget it and you don't lose it. It does something to your your soul. Your spirit doesn't sit right with certain people. And it, again, it's like it's a learning experience almost. And if you haven't learned it, you're not going to get it. And we have to take the people that have learned and get it and help other people, you know? Sure, sure. Well, isn't that what you're trying? I mean, uh, you know, in reading your bio uh, before you came in, a lot of uh, community-oriented stuff that you yeah. do. I mean, you're a teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, that's a big deal in a community. You're educating future generations. Like we mentioned before, you're on the 911 Communications Board. What I want to ask is, as, a, as we have sat here and talked, your passion is evident. When you're going through the the scripting and the research of a podcast, do you feel that passion coming out? Like as you're the further you get through your research and preparing for each episode, do you kind of feel it building up? Yeah, absolutely. Now I will tell you this: when I'm researching, I'm kind of a a black and white researcher, so I find my information and my data, and I'm just throwing that in right as I think and as new ideas come to me of what the the listener might wonder about that I already. You know, I know, but maybe a listener doesn't know. I like to take it and break it down, like different types of abuse, for example. They may not know that. So I stop and I'll break it down. But passion for me comes out once once the microphone turns on because I've got the information, but now I want to really explain it to people from a viewpoint of, you know, this is reality. This isn't just some story, black and white. Like it's like I've reached, I mean, this is a human being. This person did this to another human being. Gre like, sit on that for a minute and, and really, really understand. You know, for example, in the Jody Arias trial, they, um, you know, they talked about, oh, man, she slaughtered her boyfriend. If, I don't, if you're not familiar with the case, it's an interesting one. I'll, I'll podcast on it. <laughs> but um, there you go. I really stop and break that one down because she didn't just slaughter her boyfriend. She stabbed him 27 times. And like my students are like, wow, man. And I'm like, no, wait, let's do this real quick. I'll make them pick their hand up. And I'll say, just move your hand. Let's do it 27 times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we will keep going. And when you do that, they kind of kick back and go, oh my God, how much effort, how much energy, how much anger drove you to stab someone that many times? And that's what I want people to feel. Because the victims went through something. Sure. It's not just a headline. Right. You're, when you're thinking about that, it, it, Obviously, from an educational standpoint, you also want them to feel something. It's, yeah. it's not just a series of events. There were raw emotions and things happening all along the way. Yeah, and people suffer. And you can't discount that just for the headline. You know, um, 
It's not just a headline. When things happen to me, it's not just a headline. When they happen to you, it's not just a, a great story. It's not gossip. It's not It's not just something we think about and then, oh, we go about our day. It should be something that you are shocked by. We, and the problem, too, is that people are becoming desensitized to it. Right. You know, you say, for example, a teacher does something to a student improper, and we're like, oh, there's another one. No. No. Because the vast 99.9% .9 of us are doing the right thing. Right. They don't represent us. Sure. And we've got to get back in a mindset. I want uh, us as a community, and wherever your community might be, we need to make the predators fear us. We need to stop being afraid of them because we are the majority. Right. We are the majority. Let's band together. Let's do the right things. Let's weed these guys out and let's kick them some bricks up through to a prison. Sure. Get them out of here. Sure. You know? So when we're talking about these things that make you passionate, obviously uh, predatory situations is something that you focus on a lot. Mm -hmm. If you were talking about, uh, are you currently in your first season? Yes. Uh, okay. So Wrapping up my first season right now. Okay. And, and what would you say the focus of that has been? So I didn't know that it would go like this, but a lot of my episodes turned into um, series because it takes so much to explain it. But I got a lot of feedback from those saying, oh, my gosh, we love the explanation because we don't know. And most people aren't going to go do the, you know, in-depth research to, to find out, you know, things. But I would say the focus this go round has really been about teenagers as victims. I've covered Columbine, really broke Columbine down from a different viewpoint. I did the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas um, case that was all the way through his conviction. And I had, um, I watched the entire trial. I listened to the parents speak out. And one of the dads, his name was, um, Max Schachter. That man impressed on my soul what it means to be a parent. And that, that man, ugh, the passion and the anger in his voice, I just could not imagine. I don't want to imagine. And then I did, like, I just told you the case of the daughter and her, dad. Um, so I'd say a lot of this has been victimization of teenagers, but that's not the going to be always the focus. I'm, it's going to be completely well-rounded in the realm of criminality. Sure. But one of the things that I would, I would ask you as a follow-up to that is you teach teenagers. I do. And you're focused on this because one could argue that in those teenage years is when a lot of kids are most vulnerable. Because parents are starting to do this, at, at least most good parents, right. you know, they're they're starting to got to figure some things out on your own. They're spending a lot more time away from the nest, uh, but at the same time, they're being introduced to a lot of new and very different things. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that that would be uh, the prime time. Uh, so this would be almost just as educational for parents as it would be for those teenagers. Yes, and I'm gonna tell you this: something that I I know for a fact, is that teenagers have these devices in their hands, okay? And they have the internet at their fingertips. They have anything they want to look up right there at their fingertips and, and anything they don't want to see, right? TikTok ads and, and videos that you're not expecting to coming up. And the thing is, they're old enough to understand what the content is showing them, but they are not mature enough to process what that content means. Sure. And how it got to be that way and why it's just not acceptable, right? So there's a disconnect. They're old enough to understand it, but they're immature in that they don't see sometimes the implications of what they're viewing or what they're putting out there. Sure. That there's, they're going to cringe <laughs> when they're 30. Right. Oh, my gosh. And there's just uh, there's a general lack of context. You yes. know, and you talked about it earlier, having them s sit there with their hands and do this 27 times. Yeah. You know, that's that, that adds some context to what they're how they view right. that event. Right. So, right. Uh, so have you thought about season two? I have. We've got some I've got some stuff um, that I'm working on. I work on multiple cases at a time because I just I'm ADD and I like to jump all over the place and different sure. things excite me. Um, but I've got I've got some. um some older cases that I'm going to cover that brought about change in our laws and why we do things the way we do. And so I really, a lot of people don't know why sex offenders have to register. How did that come to be? Well, let me tell you something. A little girl lost her life 
And it could have been prevented had mama known. Right. I believe it could have been prevented if mama had known what had happened to her. And so uh, it's a good case as far as interest and holy, you know, uh, the holy crap factor, if you will. But, um, you know, how does it how do we get where we are? And then, oh, my gosh, what changes could we continue to make as technology evolves and we learn more about the criminal element and more comes to light? These laws can be updated too, where we can slam these people. Right. I don't mean vengeance. I mean justice. You know, I'm angry about what happens to these these students I teach. And if I, you know, I hold their um, trust in me very close to my heart. And so those stories, I'm not, you know, going to ever give names or anything like that, obviously. But some of these things that these kids have experienced in my territory, on my turf. Mm. Right. I'm so lucky I don't have a mugshot. Because well, I get so angry. <laughs> sure. Well, it's that passion well enough. And, and this is going to be the last question I'm going to ask you. But sure. It was a very interesting statement you just made. You said not vengeance, but justice. Could right. you give us your perspective on the difference? Sure. Vengeance is getting even. And I'm a Christian. Okay. I'm from the south side of the kingdom, but I'm a Christian. Okay. <laughs> but um, vengeance is not mine. Right. And so I don't believe in, in that. But I do believe in people getting their day, and you take that as you will. But I don't. This is the thing. I don't believe in justice for victims. I think that we have court cases that go to trial, and the people go to prison. That's not justice. Um, that's the justice system, but that's not justice because justice would be that the people who did what they did to the others got exactly what they did to their victims, and that doesn't happen. So I think that justice is a relative term. I think that um, I appreciate the justice system. We have changes we need to make, and uh, victims' voices need to be heard. But you're never going to bring back someone's loved one. Sure. Court isn't justice. Justice would have been putting that predator behind bars before he had the chance to even do it. Right. Well, that sounds like a follow-up podcast. How would you change the justice system? Yeah. I know we, I know we don't have enough time today. <laughs> but if you would, please uh, tell us again the name of your podcast and where people can find it. Sure. It's Unspeakable, a true crime podcast by Kelly Jennings. And uh, Spotify, all all podcast yep. platforms? It's on every major platform. You can also have a page on Facebook, The Unspeakable by Kelly Jennings. If you follow that page, we have the links to every uh, listening platform on there. And we have a whole lot more coming. I mean, it's a new podcast, but we're catching up. We're going to have a whole lot more for people to see and do and take advantage of. In sure, the you got to start somewhere. That's right. Uh, and who produces it? Uh, Jim Chapman. And Jim's sitting in the corner over here. Hey, Jim. You can yell hello. Hello. <laughs> Jim has been on my podcast several times, and I've been on his, uh, and I appreciated that opportunity. But, uh, yeah, Jim's got a great little studio over there uh, by Walmart in Denham Springs, uh, mm -hmm. Fidel Norte. Or, yes. Hey, I got that right. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate you joining us. If you'll introduce yourself or reintroduce yourself as we head on out here. Sure. My name is Kelly Jennings, and I'm your host of Unspeakable, a true crime podcast by Kelly Jennings. But remember, if you're easily offended, then I'm not your girl. Uh, she's sassy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and a, a very interesting, if I'd go back and listen to it, and I might clip that out, the difference between vengeance and justice. That was good. At any rate, my name is McHugh David, publisher and editor of the news. Appreciate this lady here for taking the time to come be sassy with us here on a Wednesday morning <laughs> and introduce us to her new podcast that is now out. You can go find it on all podcast platforms. Be looking for season two uh, to come out probably next year. Uh, Please remember the news is on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. We are once a week in print on Thursdays at $7 a month to get that in your mailbox. We're also online, www.livingstonparishnews.com. We appreciate you guys out there for joining us, and we'll see you next time.